Practical life activities like transferring with tongs are often the simplest and easiest way to discover Montessori activities. This variation here presents an extra challenge because the child has to work on their wrist rotation to get the carrot to the bunny. Perhaps your child is even ready to start exploring training chopsticks, especially if this is something they see you using during mealtime. And don't forget that you can rediscover old activities like transferring by simply introducing new utensils like an ice cream scooper. Or we can add additional steps to activities that our children have already mastered, such as getting the water and setting up the entire activity of flour arranging. Use something else for a vase and maybe provide a pitcher that will contain more water so your child has to stop pouring the water before it overflows. Introduce cutting the stems with some scissors with your assistance and allow them to actually clean up the entire process when they're done. You'll notice that as you allow your child to set up more of their activities, they'll become more and more careful to not spill the water along the way. They'll become more conscientious of how they're handling the activity while they work with the material. They'll become more thorough in actually cleaning up the activity when they're done, making sure that they're leaving their space nice and beautiful for their future selves. See if there's activities that you've previously used hand over hand for that your child is finally ready to explore independently, even if it does require supervision. In our case, that's watering our plants. Washing their hands from start to finish and making sure they're actually doing it for the appropriate amount of time is also a practical life activity. Even on the days when you're not exploring too many other activities, allowing your child to get their own snack or prepare their own snack is a practice in practical life activities. We can make something as simple as making a smoothie more challenging by allowing our child to collect everything they would need to make the smoothie, including their knives, their colanders and their spoons. This is also obviously a wonderful way for the child to have a chance to explore foods that they may otherwise be avoiding. Stella, for example, will only consume a strawberry if she's the one to prepare and cut it. Let your child join you in picking any of the fruits or veggies that you've been growing, or visit a local farm that allows you to have that same experience. The scent of a freshly picked tomato, or the feeling of rice as we wash it, is going to provide much more of a sensory input than any sensory bin ever could. All of these isolated activities that we work on in practical life allow our child to feel much more comfortable and much more comfortable confident when they join us for more complex activities such as making kimchi. Even I couldn't imagine the care, concentration, and refinement with which Stella did some of these tasks. If your child has been interested in a lacing blog or threading beads, perhaps they're interested in a lacing card. This one has a bit too many holes, so I would start with something simpler, but these are going to be the beginning steps to not only pre-writing skills, but eventually also sewing. And if you can believe it, our toddlers who were once hammering away at our pounding toys with all the force in the world are actually ready to hold a hammer much more elegantly and gracefully and simply tap, tap, tap away as they put these little pegs in some modeling clay. Bam, 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 bam. The child who's interested in sorting but maybe mastered simple color sorting, how about sorting between black, gray, and white, which certainly requires a bit more attention to detail and nuance. Or perhaps we introduce different shades of the same color for sorting. So you'll notice here that the green, blue, and purple aren't necessarily the exact same between the buttons and the containers. A different variation here is sorting with a scoop between the oranges and the blues. Yes, both of those colors are actually orange and not yellow. Here we're also inherently sorting between cool and warm tones. Or we can keep the colors more simple and actually make it a more refined fine motor skill. Holding the popsicle stick with that pincer grasp and having to get it into that more narrow opening of the vase. Your child may have also become interested in figuring out how to get their shoes on independently. Part of that is figuring out left from right. Rather than stickers, we simply notice that the shoes are facing away from each other when paired incorrectly and that they're close together, or as Stella likes to say, they're hugging when we pair them correctly. Focusing on that observation over trying to match any sticker that I might put inside the shoe allows her to transfer that knowledge to any other pair. An absolute favorite activity recently that I don't see mentioned a lot is polishing. We're doing toddler say silver or metal polishing. We transfer some of the toothpaste from the bowl into the plate and then using an eyedropper, dilute it with some water. Handling the eyedropper is definitely a lot more complex than simply handling some of the pipette variations we've had up until now. Using a clean toothbrush, we mix everything around and now we're ready to scrub at our item of choice. When we're done scrubbing, we'll buff everything away with a cotton pad or cloth. Your child should be able to do each of these steps independently from the other activities we've been working on before you introduce such a complex activity. You'll notice this is a lot of steps. This is really, really working on sequencing. And sequencing is an incredibly important mathematical concept. And speaking of math, your child may have started to really master these simple pattern puzzles, in which case you can make it more complex by showing them how different shapes fit together to create the shapes that they're familiar with. We can either make 2D shapes like this with the puzzle pieces from the Melissa and Doug pattern puzzle, or we can use simple building blocks to see how this would work in a 3D scale. This gradation puzzle allows us to continue exploring those 3D shapes while also working on a 
very important skill that the children will later need to build their pink tower. We're working on consistently identifying which is the current largest piece. The answer to that is constantly changing. As they put away the largest cylinder, now they have to find what is the next largest cylinder. And once the puzzle is complete, we can discuss big, medium, and small. For the child interested in numbers and counting, a self-correcting puzzle like this may be an interesting option to explore. With time, you might notice that your child is able to visually identify where there are one, two, or three items without actually having to sit there and count them. But for something that does require them to actually practice counting each individual item, a puzzle like this may be an interesting challenge because we're also working on, again, left versus right. Under every number is the corresponding number of items, and yes, the puzzle is also self-correcting. Another variation for the child who is heavily interested in something that doesn't seem to relate to math, in our case, it is animal figurines. For many of you, I know it might also be cars. This is a preliminary take on cards and counters, but because we've got these little houses for the animals with the one-to-one -one correspondence it's a lot easier for her to ensure that she's placing the correct number of animals under each number so at the end when we step back we can see just how many animals there are under 10 versus under one or two and we can jump around to the numbers that are being called out which gets us ready for our next activity a little obstacle course search for different numbers I always advocate for adding movement into an activity especially if it's an activity that your child doesn't seem that interested in at the moment remember that it is play that is the work of the child you may be surprised to know that your toddler could very well be interested in seeing how a simple scale works. While the concepts of balance and gravity are definitely still too abstract for our toddlers to understand, they're not too young to be fascinated and intrigued by seeing what happens when they're placing different numbers of items in each end of the scale. Having this concrete hands-on experience now will make the abstract concepts make a lot more sense in the future. The same thing can be said for the concept of magnetic versus non-magnetic, another classic Montessori activity. At this age, it's obviously still incredibly supervised and all we're doing is exploring what happens when we wave our magnet over magnetic items versus non-magnetic items or we can also test out and see what happens when we place magnets of the same poles versus opposite poles near each other. These experiences will encourage further curiosity and exploration when the time comes for it. And speaking of exploration, have you explored this classic little experiment with your toddler yet? Cover drops of food coloring with some baking soda and have your child add the vinegar to it to uncover the different colors. You'll notice doing this in the paint palette got very messy very quick so we switched over to these little plates instead. And while the colors were fun, which she was really captivated by, was this interaction that vinegar and baking soda had together. So we set up a little experiment. And here we're tapping into that counting skill. We're going to be counting how many scoops of baking soda we place into each plate. When she was done, we observed how much less baking soda there was in number one versus number five. And as with any good experiment, we made a hypothesis. I asked her where she thought there would be the most bubbles and where there would be the least. And she was very excited to actually test out that theory and see just how few bubbles there were in that first plate versus the endless stream of bubbles she got from that fifth plate. Another fun experiment to try is this precursor to logic, pouring water into different shaped containers and seeing how that same volume of water looks different depending on what vessel it's in. And as a bonus, this is a practice in all different types of pouring. Now again, obviously what is happening with the water is too abstract for our children to understand just yet, but they're not too young to observe and see what is happening. You see, she noticed that we've got a very wide bowl and a very tall vase. And it was very interesting for her to see the water go from being very tall to being very wide. We can do this on a smaller scale with this variation of pouring where we pour into three different vessels. If your child is still working on stopping as they pour, provide them with a smaller pitcher. But for the child who has been working on stopping as they pour, do provide a pitcher full of water that will actually be enough for all three vessels. And don't forget that pouring all the water back, soaking up the spills, and getting all that water back in the pitcher is also part of the activity. So now let's combine the two concepts. Let's add baking soda into three different shaped vessels and add vinegar into those vessels and see what happens when we're pouring vinegar into a very tall vase and how those bubbles climb up versus when we're adding vinegar into a flat plate and how those bubbles simply spread out. Now something as adults that we take for granted but is so fascinating for children is the concept of mixing colors. We've worked on mixing colors with our magnet tiles and our paints before but doing this with just the different colored water really zeroed in on that concept alone. We've done this with the test tubes a few times now and my biggest tip is to actually just focus on making one color at a time that way you don't have to worry about dividing the different colors equally as you're mixing them.
Perhaps our biggest passion this summer were planets. I introduced this simple matching work after I noticed an interest in the sun and she has become completely enamored in the concept of planets. She's learning how to name all of them, the order they go in, and we've even made this giant mural so she can see the different sizes of the planets. And of course, one of the planets she's very interested in exploring is the Earth. Just like your child might take you by surprise with being able to remember the different planets, you may also be surprised that they're able to remember different continents and be actually interested in figuring out where they go on the globe. And not only that, they may very well be interested about all the different people and cultures and animals and all the different things that exist on these different continents. I've shared our love for monument matching works before and you can see that they have definitely grown in scale since then. And I do have a separate video on cultural studies specifically, so I'll go ahead and link that for you here. A different way to explore different parts of the world is through different habitats and the different animals that live in those habitats. While I previously presented this work by first reading these books and then working on the sorting activity, now Stella utilizes these books as a reference point. She's able to self-correct with the resources that she has on hand. Last time we talked about also sorting animals who walk versus animals who swim, and now we have added the extra layer of animals that can fly. And you can see again we're using our book as a reference point because it also provides us that beautiful view of what these animals look like in their natural habitats and what it actually looks like when a bird is flying versus walking versus swimming. Now an interesting thing about sorting activities like this is you will inherently run into animals that fit into multiple categories. And this is a great way to see if your child is actually understanding the concept or simply remembering where you placed each individual item. For example, freshwater birds. They are birds that fly, they also have legs so they can walk, but they also have webbed feet, so they're able to swim in the water. But because we've talked about webbed feet and other animals that can swim, Stella is able to properly put them in any of the three categories. And to my surprise, this also led down the path of exploring what amphibians are and separating between different fish and animals that live only in the water versus amphibians who are able to be in the water versus in the land. And perhaps your toddler doesn't live and breathe for animals, but there may be something else that they're incredibly interested in. So just know that they're capable of absorbing and understanding and being curious about a lot more information than we might even think is possible. Changing gears into the sensory motor activities, have you had a chance to introduce making shapes with forms in the sandbox? Not only is this a sensorial exploration, it also requires a lot of sequencing as well as refined motor movement. And for the child who is very interested in different sensorial explorations, we can do some sensorial matching. An activity like this allows a child to go from simply exploring to then matching to eventually closing their eyes and only focusing on their sense of touch to make the match. Rough versus smooth is another classic Montessori sensory motor activity. Very easy to set up by simply Collecting a number of items that are either rough or smooth. And you can add a challenging piece like this one, which is actually rough on one side and smooth on the other. This variation of clothespins on a basket is actually clothespins on pipe cleaners, which works fine motor skills on both hands and also has an additional sensory input. For the child who's really mastered color matching, perhaps they'd be interested in taking that to a much larger scale. Something that's really interested me in the Montessori class is when children choose to do a very large work, something that will take a lot of effort and time. It requires a lot of patience and concentration, but they are so incredibly proud at the end. Let's talk about language development. If there is a story that your child has been incredibly enamored with, in our case it's Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and you're noticing that your child is starting to retell parts of that story, perhaps they'd be interested in this version of sequencing where they have to lay out the different pictures from that story, hopefully the same pictures that are in your actual book, in order. For an incredibly verbal child like Stella, perhaps they'd be interested in retelling the story on their own once they're done. Or perhaps they're more interested in retelling short nursery rhymes. We worked up to this by me simply omitting one word and then two words and then three words every time that I retold these nursery rhymes to Stella at bedtime. And the kind of recall that our children need in order to be able to retell these nursery rhymes and stories is the kind of recall that they're practicing with these memory matching games. When you first introduce them, you can simply introduce two pairs so your child can understand the concept of the game and simply build up from there. Activity sticker books can present exciting and new opportunities to develop language. These sticker books had a lot of item to silhouette matching that Stella is already very familiar with and it got her very interested in exploring more Korean words. And if you've noticed your little one trying to draw any shapes or lines or even saying that they're drawing numbers and letters, perhaps they're ready for a sand tray. We have been having a lot of fun simply exploring the different shapes that we can make in the sand, creating some very simple letters. And so we're definitely on our way to now exploring sandpaper letters and incorporating the two together. Now this is a supervised activity to ensure that the sand doesn't go flying everywhere, but because this is something she's very interested in exploring, she's very keen to be very careful with this material. It's in book. Mmm. 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 Mmm.
Z Zal. But we can also develop language simply by playing board games together. This first orchard game has been a huge hit for us. And yes, we're obviously working on some color matching, some fine motor skills, but it's also presented an opportunity to talk about things like your turn, my turn, first, next, and last. But what better way to develop language than simply going outside, seeing and feeling and touching all of the leaves, seeing the branches, the trunks, and the root system of the trees. Of course, incorporating that gross motor movement. Other gross motor skills that your child might be working on is balancing, whether it's balancing between different stepping stones like this or balancing on a balancing beam. And if they've mastered that, perhaps they're up for the challenge of actually trying to crawl on the balance beam. We can also practice balancing on different elevated surfaces. If you're fortunate enough to have a playground that has one of these next to you, your child may have a chance to practice these outside as well. I've noticed after incorporating more activities like this, Stella has become more confident with climbing up and down the stairs with alternating feet. While obstacle courses with different heights and different types of balancing are always going to be a huge hit, what about exploring gross motor skills through imitating other animals or insects? Jumping like a grasshopper, flying like a butterfly, crawling like an ant, maybe flying like a bird. I think this was her imitation of a fly. And with all that silly movement, it's likely not long until your little one starts dancing. So let's turn on some music and also incorporate some rhythm while we're at it. Some more complex moves like walking on our toes, simply bouncing to the beat, or even spinning in circles. Of course, no dance party is complete without some singing. <laughs> Now that we've ventured over into the artistic side, I've touched on coloring books before on this channel and we are not against coloring books. They do not take the place of freeform art, but they're a great way to receive inspiration on what can be done, a great way to practice the hand strength that is needed to hold a pencil, as well as the refinement needed to eventually stay within the lines. We've also progressed further in our scissor use journey, so now we're more comfortable cutting these thin strips of paper. All the transferring with the tongs and the tweezers has definitely paid off. We've started separating out the different scraps that we cut into a little tray like this, and then you utilizing them to create different crafts. And this is where freeform art can come in. We're also using glue with a paintbrush, which again, will practice that hand strain that she needs for holding a pencil later for writing. Don't forget to include a variety of items for your child to practice gluing. Not only is this great simply for their creativity, it's also a wonderful sensorial exploration. It also allows them to really practice maneuvering objects in different ways to be able to actually get them to stick. If your child has been avoiding color matching, perhaps this is a way that might be interested in practicing color matching. And a middle ground between between the coloring books and complete freeform art is working with inspiration. Like I said, we've been really interested in animals and for a while we were very interested in the safari, so Stella wanted to paint the safari. Rather than telling her what that should look like, I simply opened up a page of one of her safari books and gave her the paints that she would need, modeled how to carefully work with a paintbrush, as well as a couple of strokes. And you can see she's recreating some of the circles as well as some of the lines that I showed her. And if your child asks you to help them or to make something look like something, it's completely okay to help them. You can see Stella actually wanted to draw a tree and she asked me to help her draw a trunk. And all of this has been a very long list of activities. A lot of our days have simply been filled with pretend play because it is so incredibly important and crucial at this age. All of the language development, the fine motor skills, the sequencing, as well as the social emotional learning that we're hoping to accomplish through all of these activities can also occur through pretend play. So if that is what your child is incredibly interested in right now, simply create an environment that allows them to explore a couple of accessories that will allow them to even further develop into their pretend play. As always, I hope this has given you some ideas of the ways that you can support your child's development and learning through play. And until next time, I hope you stay safe.